summer, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't really notice any, any great difference. <laughs> but I didn't get sick. It's worth trying some of these things. Ten less mosquitoes to bite you. Less mosquitoes to bite me. You know, I've always thought, like, how many people have a deer problem? You don't have a deer problem, you just have a deficiency of venison stew recipes. <laughs> or, well, you know, we're not allowed to discharge firearms in the city and all that kind of thing. And if you're a vegetarian, it won't work. Hmm? Deficiency of rosemary plants or to, to around your other garden. And deficiency of rosemary plants or other kind of smelly things that they don't like. Yeah. You have a deficiency of mountain lions. <laughs> a deficiency of mountain lions. And, and a friend of mine uh, kind of got control of the deer by uh, going out to the wildlife refuge in San Antonio mm -hmm. and getting mountain lion, because they have several there that they're just keeping, mm -hmm. stacked mm -hmm. and dropping it around their air acreage and it got rid of the deer. Wow, did we hear that? Yeah. So, to get, get some, um, get, rent get a urine, urine and yeah, rent, a lion. Uh, rent, <laughs> rent a mountain lion, or if it's not feasible to rent a mountain lion in your area, just <laughs> procure some of their urine or poop. Um, yeah. Hint, hint, perhaps the urine of any large mammal would work. <laughs> it might be good to experiment. Yeah. We were looking for goats because we had a bunch of poison oak in the backyard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Too bad we don't have any goats to eat this poison oak. Oh yeah, goats, goats to eat poison oak. There are people who rent out goats to eat poisonous plants, poison ivy and other plants. So it's, that's a permaculture is very much about looking into those kind of solutions. And it just some people get discouraged. I mean, I think all of us have gotten discouraged at one time or another about all the big world problems that seem insoluble. And we think, what, what can we do by ourselves? How can the action of one person make that big of a difference? Well, it makes a difference in many ways. First of all, the, you know, the whole ocean is just a bunch of drops of water. So any little thing we do is adding to the solution. Also, there's a multiplier effect. Anything you do is, when you do it with just kind of a pure spirit, you're not doing it to show off or you know, punish other people. You're just doing it because you believe it's the right thing. Other people notice that and other people copy that. There is a multiplier effect. There is also... Um, an effect on your energy. There's an effect on your personal energy and morale. And the better your energy and the higher your morale, the more that you'll be able to do. So there is every reason to do small things. You know, every little, every single day, every small thing you can do. And permaculture is about starting small and then making small, steady improvements. Um, a lot of people get real excited when they see Toby Heavenway's book, they see Guy's garden, they see the beautiful lawn that got turned into not a lawn that's just nothing but food now growing all over the place. Um, it took a while. People want that overnight. You know, I'm going to buy a bunch of trees and, you know, it's going to be like $40,000 or something. I mean, and then, and then people get discouraged by either how much money it costs or even if you have the money, how much effort it takes to maintain that because there's no substitute for observing the patterns in your environment and then responding and so if you're willing to be a little bit patient you know um, and you might say but we don't have time we've got to start you know we don't have time we need to have it now well start now but just start real steady with something manageable and if the thing that stacks the deck in our favor is if we are cooperating and exchanging information with other people that's what accelerates the process if it was each one of us having to do a lone pioneer homestead. Some of us might live. I, I wouldn't live very long. I would like, you know, wouldn't last too long on my own solo pioneer homestead. Got to have my fellow human beings to exchange gardening tips with. And what they're good at making is not what I'm good at making. And so we got to, we got to draw on each other. Very important. Now I'm going to give, I've made a little list of things you can do today that are that will contribute, that will improve the design of the human environment, or that will get you, get you on a path to improving the design of your environment. A lot of these things, a lot of you guys are already doing. So, compost. Pretty much a lot of people here are composting. If you've never composted, start, get a little coffee can, just start collecting those food scraps. And even if you just toss them outside under a tree and cover them with leaves, it's still compost. 
it won't go as fast as it would in a, in a three by three foot bin where it's a critical mass and it's cooking, but you're still composting. Even if it's, even if varmints come dig it up, you know, you're still putting it out there, you're still not, you know, flushing it down the garbage disposal, you're still not putting it in the trash where it gets transported to the landfill, yada yada. It's still something. So do, do a little composting, collect a little compost. Mm. Collect a little gray water. You know, one of my friends who's very knowledgeable, he's an engineer, he wrote this dissertation the other day on gray water collection systems and how great they are. They are great, but like not all of us are engineers. And the truth is, I collect gray water every day by washing my dishes in a tub, and then I take the tub and I dump it outside. It might be one gallon, it might be three gallons, but it's something. Um, a permy thing to do would be to stake out a, like a one foot by one foot or three foot by three foot patch of grass and do a gray water experiment with it. Start pouring like a gallon or three of gray water on it every day. Look at it at the end of a week. Look at it at the end of two weeks. You know, Those little simple things like that, you know, things like your worms, things like your bins, you start to look forward to that every day, don't you? You look forward to visiting your worms and see how they're doing and see what's new, see what's new in the bin. Yeah. yeah. I look forward to visiting my rain barrel, like how much rainwater is in there right now? You know, how much do we have left? What does it look like? So what else? You can mulch. Is everybody everybody into mulching? Collect lots of mulch. You see those bags by the curbside? Did anyone ever ever grab those bags that they put out? Yeah. Sometimes I'm, I only use a bicycle, but I've got a big bike trailer, so I'll go get those bags of leaves, and then I'll go dump them onto my little spit of land. And then sometimes I'll take the bag back to the people's house, because I know they have to pay for those bags. So they get those bags back, and they get to fill them with more leaves for me. <laughs> look, at, look, in the cur look in the gutter, there can be grass clippings in there. That's some mulch, too. It's all mulch. Um, unplug. This is an interesting experiment. You can always unplug something. In our houses, there's stuff that sucks up electricity, whether you're using it or not. You can try unplugging those. One of the biggest excuses I can think of for not unplugging things like that, the VCR or the clock or whatever, is because when you plug it back in, it's flat. it thinks there was a power failure and that time is just flashing, flashing, flashing. Um, that's where if I had kids, that would be the kid's job. Hey kid, your job, I mean, whether the kid is 18 months old or 7 years old, they're going to be better than I am at reprogramming that, that stupid thing. Um, that would be their job. When, when you plug that back in, reprogram it, okay, Junior? And they'll have it done right then. Um, so unplug something. And if you feel really bold ever, un do, a, a, do an electricity-free evening at your house. Just like, un has anyone ever tried this? Have no lights? You tried it? How'd that go? Yeah? Yeah? Did, what did you do? It feels different. Yeah? What did you guys do when you didn't have lights and you were just kicking back there? Play some music? Well, actually, we had the house set up so that I would actually switch the breakers off before I went to bed so there was no electricity in the bedroom. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, it was, it was just just switch the breaker off. It was relaxing. Yeah. Some people think that the, the electric network, the electricity, it creates something called a Faraday cage around your, your house. It's basically a network of it's an electric current. And some say that it's not good for the body or the mind. And a lot of people feel like you sleep better and, and your body gets in better, better tune without that. So it's worth, worth trying. And if you get real excited about it, invite your neighbors over and you know, have, a little, have a little power down block party, pajama party. And, you know, kids, kids seem to really enjoy stuff like this. Um, grow something. You know, I'm not a very good gardener and have a lot of heat and not enough sun. It's a really like, kind of an icky gardening situation. I grow sprouts. I grow kefir. I grow kombucha. Um, you know, I always have something in the garden even if it's not turning out so great. Even my okra got cooked this year. But you can always grow something. And if you're really good at growing stuff, then encourage your neighbors to grow something. You know, say, here, here's a seedling, try it. Or give them a tomato and they'll get inspired themselves to, to grow it. Um, and neighbor, again, meet a neighbor. Does anyone have neighbors that you don't know? 
I, I have. I mean, I can always think of the next wave of neighbors over. I once lived in an apartment building in Tokyo for two years and never met a single one of my neighbors. And I don't think I was the only one. I think that nobody was meeting their neighbors in that place. So we could always say, well, it wasn't set up for that. It wasn't set up for people to meet each other. It was set up for people to keep away from each other. Um, so one way to reverse this kind of bad design is for us to start taking matters into our own hands and meet our neighbors. Share your surplus again, you know, whatever it is, that tomato or that spare labor. If I see, you know, a neighbor struggling with a, with a big heavy load or something, offer to help them lift it or, you know, offer to teach somebody how to compost, you know, just offer to share.